I broke the law. I went AWOL. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. Welcome back, my little Liberty Lizards, to the Lions of Liberty podcast, your home for great conversations about the ideas of liberty. This is episode number 206, which means you can find today's show notes featuring links to everything we discuss over at lionsofliberty.com slash 206. Today's show is sponsored by Health Excellence Select, an incredible, free market, affordable, legal alternative to your standard Obamacare corporatized insurance. To learn more, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. All right, guys, my guest today is making his return to this program after coming on the show a little over a year ago to describe his situation at the time as a conscientious objector attempting to end his military service as a musician he is now returning to this program as a civilian. He is also the host of a podcast, The Trumpet Dynamics Show, and the soon-to-be-returning outside the music box. He is Mr. James Newcomb. James, welcome back. It's my pleasure, Mark. Well, great to have you here, James. And uh, like I mentioned, um, you know, since I last spoke to you a little bit over a year ago, you were in the military, you were a musician, you were unhappy with uh, your service, <laughs> and uh, you are no longer in that position. So I guess, first of all, congratulations, because you have achieved uh, your goal, which was to get out of that role. That was my goal, and uh, the means by which it ended up happening was um, not the way that I thought it would go, and we can talk about that more if you'd like. But um, yes, mission accomplished. I uh, was re- discharged officially on January 31st. And uh, actually, technically, left the military in the beginning of December and did what is called terminal leave, which basically you have uh, a certain number of days of leave that you accrue every month. And uh, at the end of your term of service, however many days of leave you have saved up is you can basically count that towards the end of your term. So Just stack them all at yep. the end there, huh? So I had almost 60 days saved up, so had a nice little break before my uh, – uh, commitment ended. So, yep. So beginning of December, I've been a free man. Not too bad. And, uh, you know, you can hear the full interview, the full kind of in-depth, detailed story of uh, James's tale here back in episode 92 of this program. So go ahead and click back in your iTunes feed, your Stitcher feed, or go over to lionsofliberty.com slash podcast where we have the full archive if you want to check that out. But James, why don't you just first give sort of, a, I guess, the Cliff Notes version of your story. Why were you unhappy in the Army with your role there? And uh, why did you kind of do what you had to do to get out of that role and, and attempt to do so as a conscientious objector? Well, I guess it was just uh, over a, a period of many months and eventually years where I just grew, I guess, more and more aware of the role of the military in the world. I mean, I was always, you know, a little more educated than most people on foreign affairs and uh, current events. So it's not like I entered the military pleading complete ignorance, but it's just, uh, I guess I saw my role as a musician contributing directly to something that I found morally objectionable. And so there is a process by which people who um, find themselves in that position, once they volunteer to enlist or become an officer in the army or in the military, there is a very legal and very valid path called conscientious objection. And I followed the steps. And what I didn't mention in my interview last year is that when you and I spoke I had put in the application almost eight months prior to us speaking. And you have to understand that eight months is the typical uh, length of time that it takes to, uh, like, you put in the paperwork, eight to nine months later, it finally gets approved or disapproved. And that might sound like a ridiculous amount of time, it is. But when I spoke to you, Mark, my paperwork hadn't even left my duty station. I mean, it was stalled. There was just absolute incompetence. There was zero movement at all. Huh? Zero movement. I would ask my chain of command weekly as to its status, and I would get a bunch of fluff as to what's going on with it. Do you think that was because of any sort of specific, oh, this guy wants to be a conscientious objector? That's difficult to say sometimes. <laughs> this guy wants to be a conscientious objector, and you know, maybe we're not going to really try to process his thing because who cares? Or is it more just the bureaucracy of the system that's just more of an innocent way? Like, that, this is kind of how it works. I was in Korea. So Korea was a different animal than anything I've ever experienced and hope to never experience. 
A lot of the people are, are there for just a year. They leave their families in the United States so they can go to Korea for, you know, for just a short time. It's a stepping stone to something that they really want. So a lot of people are there and they really half-hearted. They're in a very different state of mind than they would ordinarily be in a different uh, duty station. So I think what happened was just, it was just a real apathy, not necessarily towards something like what I was doing, but I saw stuff like that happen all the time with uh, people's pay, people not getting paid for trips they took to uh, the United States. It would take forever to get people just to settle on a credit card voucher. So I can't say that it was bias against me as a conscientious objector, although I can say that, and I suspect that there was some bias, but I'm not going to get into that. But uh, it was just real apathy and just really, people just didn't really take their work very seriously over there, in my opinion. And then what was the final method you you kind of mentioned earlier that you had to use (laughs) to actually get this thing moving? And obviously in, in less than a year's time, you were finally able to get it done. So what was actually, did it take to get that final push to actually get through the process and be cleared, be released from the military? I broke the law. I went AWOL and, uh, they reduced me in rank. And because of that reduction in rank, I had went over the limit the time limit that that particular rank was allowed to be in the military. And so I was uh, given a new, what's called an ETS, which is uh, end of term of service. I was given a new ETS date and uh, we took that date and I took my, my leave that I've already mentioned and put it towards that. And that's how I did it. Uh, So the, uh, the traditional methods that you were really, really working hard to try to go through. I mean, that was uh, the biggest thing you emphasized really in our first interview was Mm -hmm. how, you know, you signed this contract and as unhappy as you were, you didn't want to just flake out and walk away. You wanted to really try to push through in what you would call the right way to do things. But it seems that no matter what you tried, that right way to do things just seemed to go nowhere. Yes. I mean, I did what I thought was the honorable thing to do. You know, a man realizes that he can't do his job in good conscience. And a lot of people would just uh, kind of stick their head in the sand and just continue to collect a paycheck and then hit their 20 years and then get a retirement check for the rest of their life. That wasn't what I wanted to do. I just realized I was put on this earth for more than to sit here and be miserable and hate my life and my job and hate myself for doing this job. And um, I just wanted something more than that. And as time went on, we finally had the uh, hearing with a, uh, what's he called? An investigating officer is what they call it. Finally had it. And then again, the paperwork got stalled. Something got left that should have gone into the packet to the Pentagon. And again, we were waiting and waiting and waiting. And all this time, As you might imagine, I was getting a little bit upset and I started to become, quite frankly, someone that I wasn't really proud of. I began to act out in certain situations and react to what otherwise was very tame situations in a way that I wasn't proud of and I was becoming someone that I didn't recognize and I didn't like and it was time for a change and uh, my commanding officer and I had some differences and he was uh, very rude to me and maybe I was rude to him. I didn't intend to be, but uh, I ended up putting in a request to leave the band there in Korea just because I felt I was very mistreated by him. And uh, after I left the unit, they sent me to what is called the uh, OEF. No, the uh, that's a big military exercise right on the DMZ. And I think that's what put me over the top and made me start to think of maybe there's other options that I should be pursuing. They sent me to this war exercise and it's computer simulated, but it's still a war exercise. It's the real deal. It's like North Korea is a real enemy of the United States. And every time that they have this exercise twice a year, there is always a response from North Korea. And it's because of this exercise. And they put a conscientious objector, someone who over a year prior had put in an application to be discharged from the army as a CO in this exercise. 
But just the fact that they would put me in that situation, it just made me think these guys just don't really, they just don't take their job seriously. What does that entail? That Because you, you mentioned it's a kind of a computer simulated exercise, but mm-hmm. obviously you're physically there. So can you just kind of describe that? I'm just curious. I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around how that actually works. There was a base that is about two miles away from the North and South Korea border. And we set up tents and we set up uh, all of the computers and all of the doohickeys that go into actually fighting a war. It was like the nerve center for a warfare campaign. By computer simulated, I mean that there is a, like a North Korean enemy that is simulated on the computer. And so the Americans and the uh, all the other nations that they bring in, they would fight this simulated enemy. And of course, they always win. They plan the celebration dinner weeks in advance. And the funny thing is I objected to going to this. I called up the battalion commander after I was ordered to go to this and I said, I can't do this. I just had this sinking feeling in my gut that this just is not right. And I called battalion commander up, who is my commander's commander, and I I, I just can't do this. I was sent anyway. And um, later that day, I think the day I got there or the day after I got there, there was actual mortar rounds being fired from South Korea into North Korea. And so, like, this is real stuff. And they put a conscientious subjector into this situation. And then a week after I got back from that exercise, I got on a plane, uh, flew to Taiwan, and spent a few days there with a friend of mine, and flew back to Korea, showed the sergeant major of the band the uh, photo of my passport, a photo of my plane ticket, and said, this is what I did. This is an admission of guilt. I broke the rules. Deal with it however you see fit. So that trip to Taiwan was unauthorized. You were aware of that. You basically just did it as a you had reached your tipping point with this exercise and said, all right, well, then I've reached <laughs> my tipping point and I'm going to go knowingly, flagrantly break a rule so that you have to respond in some way. Yeah. When I made the trip, it wasn't my intention to like turn myself in as soon as I got back. But then once I got back, I realized, you know what? this would seal the deal. (laughs) And uh, this would do it. So why not? What do I have to lose? Why should I care what rank I have when I leave the military? Why should I care if it's an honorable or uh, just a general or maybe even a bad conduct discharge, bad conduct by their standards? Who cares? What do I care? I'm a conscientious objector. How do they actually phrase your discharge? Is it a dishonorable discharge? or No, it was honorable. Well, there you go. (laughs) They just gave me the reduction in rank. And um, so I have to suffer through the ignominy of knowing that I didn't leave the military as a non-commissioned officer. I think I can live with that. I think I can be 80 years old and tell my grandkids that (laughs) (laughs) and know that I did the right thing. James, well, it sure does sound like you did the right thing, at least for yourself. And uh, we're going to dig a little bit more into your decision and the the ramifications of it in a minute. But first, I need to encourage my listeners to do the right thing, and that's to ditch their Obamacare health care plan and check out our great sponsors at Health Excellence Select. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I purchased my own health insurance. So personally, I was hit by some serious sticker shock after the implementation of Obamacare. My deductible more than doubled, my premium shot through the roof, and I'm just sitting here thinking, what am I actually getting for this? I'm a healthy guy. I don't go to the doctor. I really hadn't even been to a doctor for any major medical problem in years and years and years. So why would I spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month and then have to spend six or $8,000 in deductibles before I even see a dime of coverage for my health care? It just didn't add up. And it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up for most of us. But luckily, there is an alternative out there now. It's an alternative known as health sharing. And health sharing is simply awesome. (laughs) I've gotten paid for every single medical bill I've submitted in full, 100%. This is not a joke. After I spend $500, I get everything else back. And our friends at Health Excellence Select have kicked it up a notch. They'll do all the work for you. They will find your doctors. They will set appointments for you. They'll provide you 24-7 access to doctors via Skype. So you don't even need to go to a doctor or pay a dime half the time. Health Excellence Select is truly revolutionary, and you guys are doing yourselves a disservice if you do not look into this amazing alternative to your standard corporatized Obamacare health insurance. You can learn more by heading over to lionsofliberty.com slash health, or if you're ready to sign up, you can directly call my representative, Jeff Cantor, at 440-283-6849. Tell him Mark from Lions of Liberty sent you. 
Uh, James, I'm wondering how this decision was received by you know any of your peers, either peers in the military, maybe people that you've been with in previous service. I mean, did a lot of people just really understand where you're coming from and respect it? Or, I mean, did you face any resistance for kind of the way this all went down? Overall, people were receptive to it. I don't think people really agreed with me. If they did, they'd all be objecting, I, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if, if they all agreed, then wouldn't have a military. Of the few people that did know, they were supportive. They probably didn't agree with me. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the army. But I didn't face any serious resistance. I didn't face any serious persecution. I think that there were a couple of instances where people acted out in a certain way and they were kind of, uh, I felt like they were a little biased towards me. And on the surface, it had nothing to do with my convictions, but I believe that their bias towards me contributed to them treating me in a certain way. There wasn't anybody who was rude or blatantly uh, disrespectful to, towards me about it. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess you weren't exactly walking around the base with a, you know, conscientious objector t-shirt on or anything like that. I mean, this no, was, I mean, this is very yeah. a personal thing for you, much more than it was that meant to be a, a big political statement you were trying to make. It was a very personal thing. And I, all I wanted to do was just leave so I could do what I wanted to do and, <laughs> and not do what I didn't want to do, which was to play a bunch of music supporting the military doing stuff that I disapproved of personally. So how's this transition been for you? I mean, yeah, obviously you're living in the United States now, you're with your wife, you're with your kids. So obviously that stuff is all a positive because you can spend much more time with the people you care about. But uh, how's the transition been overall? The transition has been like, man, a year ago when I talked to you, I was in dire straits emotionally and uh, spiritually now it's like 180 degree. You know, times are tough when you're reaching out to obscure libertarian podcasts, you know, for a therapeutic interview. <laughs> That's when I hit rock bottom when I called you and said, can I do an interview on your show? <laughs> no, but like the difference between even six months ago and now is just uh, dramatic. It's the, probably the most dramatic change in my life I've ever experienced. I had saved a pretty good chunk of money while I was in the military the military gave me some severance pay when they let me go. So we've been living off of that. I've been working on my online media business. We're here in Minneapolis. We are decided we're going to settle here for a little while at least, let my son spend some time with the grandparents. And uh, we're just exploring uh, various business opportunities to see how I can share this beautiful thing called music with uh, other people and really enrich people's lives with it. So to answer your question, it is very, very positive. What, what are the biggest challenges? Because obviously, you know, you're in a better state emotionally, you're in a better you know, peace of mind. But are there any challenges to just transitioning from that lifestyle? Because obviously, the military is a very rigid lifestyle. Your day is pretty much, I think, planned out for you a lot of the time. So I mean, is it at all challenging to actually not have that structure or to, uh, to have all this freedom suddenly? Well, yes, you have your days planned, you have your wardrobe planned, you have your uh, haircut schedule planned. Yes. So there is some rigidity in that, but uh, I sort of had a reputation among my coworkers of being someone who sort of broke the mold, who didn't really conform to stuff like that. Like, <laughs> this is something that I don't remember saying, but it's something that I would say. Someone asked me why I didn't uh, stand at, it's called parade rest, which is you stand with your hands behind your back while you're talking to a superior, someone who outranks you. And I... I just sort of really didn't do that. And someone asked me... Like you never did it the whole well, time? Well, I mean, there were times when I did it, but I really didn't want to. Right. So someone asked me, why do you not stand at parade rest for when the sergeant major is talking? And I said, I'm not really into that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't remember saying that, but someone told me that I said that. And I said, yeah, I think I would say that. Yeah. So once I left the military, it was like someone just getting into his natural habitat. Like I was just out of my element in the military. I just didn't belong there. James, you know, when you were on the show last time, 
Uh, you promised that once you were out of the military that you'd be a little bit more outspoken about some things and things that you couldn't really be as outspoken about while you were actually in the military. So, you know, is there one thing in particular, any particular, you know, area that you have have been more outspoken about? Or is there anything you'd like to, you know, be more outspoken about right now since we're here talking about it anyway? Well, to tell you the truth, since leaving the military, I haven't been uh, like an outspoken critic or proponent of anything political. I found that even going to sites like lourockwell.com, it just got to be depressing after a while because here I was in the situation where, you know, that I've already described. And then I go to Lou Rockwell or antiwar.com and read about uh, all of these horrible things that are happening perpetrated by the U.S. military. And I just had to stop watching it after a while. I just had, not because I didn't want to visit those sites, I just couldn't and keep my sanity. So since leaving, I've honestly focused on music. And I'm certainly aware of things that are political. I'm aware of things that are going on. But I just, I don't speak out for or against much of anything at this point. But now, since I'm talking to you, Mark, I will say, and this is something that I wanted to make sure that I included in this interview, is do you remember when that hospital in Afghanistan got burned down or uh, got fired upon last October? I do. Yeah. I remember that happening and reading about it on the internet and the news and everything. And I just remember going back to work the following Monday. I think that happened on a Friday or a Saturday. And I went back to work on a Monday. And I just remember thinking how it was just business as usual, like as if nothing had ever happened. I don't know where you work or where people listening to this work, but if you had an employer that had bombed a hospital in Afghanistan, your uh, environment at work the following workday would be pretty different than the previous day. But I just remember just watching people, just kind of taking in my environment and just the casual attitude that everyone had as if nothing had happened. It was like, oh, well, it's a war. Things happen. Sorry. I'm sorry for the people who lost their families and I'm sorry for the Americans who and the foreigners who were trying to save people in Afghanistan. I'm sorry, but it's war, man. That's just the way it is. But anyway, what's for lunch? Yeah. What's for lunch? Where are we going for dinner? And uh, that week is the week that I had my uh, actual Article 15 proceedings where I got demoted. And the people were scolding me for breaking the rules. They were chastising me for not complying with the regulations. And I just thought, you picked a really bad week to preach morality to me. Sorry. Yeah. It's just a, such a casual indifference. Did you say anything like that in the proceeding or is this just kind of your internal dialogue? That was my internal dialogue. I kept my mouth shut. I saw no reason to provoke anyone any further than I already had. Sure. Because they could, <laughs> I mean, if they wanted, they could just punish you, you know, by keeping you there, I guess. I mean, since they know that you want to leave, they know you're trying to get out as a conscientious objector. So I guess uh, whatever keeps things going smoothly was your best strategy at that point. Yes. Silence was golden at that point. <laughs> So it sounds like you're really in a kind of a decompression stage, James, where you spent so much time immersed in this to the point that you obviously you had to think about this every single day, this thing that you're doing, being involved in a system that you'd really come to distrust and it come to really even just make you sick to go to work in the morning. So now you're free from that. You're out of it. You can be your own person, but you know, you're not quite ready to immerse yourself in the deep thinking of it all quite again. And I, I don't really blame you because now that you're free, why don't you spend time on things that make you happy and that, you know, things that you can uh, hopefully Hopefully, uh, bring some new light to other people with your, you know, mm -hmm. with your projects, your, you know, your trumpet dynamic show, and I guess uh, you're also going to be returning to your other program outside the music box. So why don't you just yeah. go ahead and uh, and plug all these projects you got going on? Well, the thing about what I'm doing is, even if you're not focused specifically on politics, you can still spread the message of freedom and liberty through your work. Like I had Stefan Kinsella on Outside the Music Box talking about intellectual property. And um, once that podcast relaunches in July, that's going to be one of the first interviews that I put on. So, you know, I, I guess I sort of see myself as an ambassador for freedom in my own sphere, within my own circle of influence. Like, you don't hear a whole lot of musicians talking about politics 
with other musicians. And when they do, that's usually nothing that I want to be around. So I can still talk about freedom and liberty without specifically mentioning politics or without specifically mentioning freedom and liberty. I have a blog called jamesnewcomb.co, jamesnewcomb.co. You get it? And uh, so I'm just sharing ideas that are libertarian, not in politics, but they're libertarian in lifestyle and they're libertarian in mindset. And so just a guy who leaves the military and now he's an entrepreneur making it happen, building audiences and, uh, you know, eventually an income. That's a story of liberty in and of itself. It sure is. I mean, and especially like you said, when you came to me a year ago, you were uh, at the bottom of the bottom. You had really <laughs> you didn't it felt like you had nowhere else to go. So, of course, you have to reach out to a, a libertarian podcast to get things out there. But now you're clearly in such a better place. And I think part of it was, you know, channeling your energy into what things you are passionate about. Uh, and then at the same time, not wavering from your own personal moral stance, even when things weren't really going through, because uh, eventually it, it did work out and uh, maybe not the exact way way, uh, the, taking the exact path you thought you might take to get there, but here you are, and uh sounds like you're doing great. So I'm glad you could come on the show and, and update us today. I'm glad my audience out there can get a little update on your story, and, uh, and I hope people can learn some lessons from your little tale here, James. Well, it's been my pleasure, and thanks for the kind words, Mark. James, keep up the great work, and uh, you know we'll be sure to check out Outside the Music Box, and if you're at all interested in this stuff, guys, Trumpet Dynamics, Outside the Music Box, be sure to look them up. Sweet. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed my discussion today with Mr. James Newcomb. It was great to follow up with him after over a year ago, hearing his really emotional story of of kind of how he found himself in this situation as a trumpeter for the U.S. Army, engaged in propaganda that he just could not live with doing every single day to the point that he actually had to take a pretty drastic action to get through it. And as we discussed in the last interview, which of course I'll link to over in the show notes, lionsofliberty.com slash 206, James was trying really, really hard to do things the right way. He had spent eight months just at that point trying to get out of this in through the proper channels. And then months and months and months after that, he had still seen no headway whatsoever. And, you know, joining the military, joining the army, it's not something to be taken lightly. And it's not like a normal job, though. You know, a normal job, even if you have a contract... Anybody can leave a normal job. It's a completely voluntary relationship. There might be some ramifications if you break a contract, but you're not going to be physically enslaved in basically any other profession than when you sign up for the military. Now, we can say, okay, well, he knew that signing up, and, and that may be true. That is true. Of course it is. But I think when you get to a point when you really feel physically ill over something you're doing, when you feel that it's the wrong thing to do, and yet you have to get up every day and go do it anyway, I mean, that's just something that has to rack on your soul, and that's just no way to live. So I absolutely respect and appreciate the fact that even after trying through all the channels every single way possible to do things the quote-unquote right way, James eventually did do what he had to do to make himself happy, to be with his family, and to not be stressed out over essentially being a propagandist for what he sees as a military that's often engaging in really terrible acts. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody in the military is terrible. I'm sure James knows that. He has a lot of friends in the military. My father was in the Air Force. I don't think that the individual human beings that are in our military are necessarily all bad. There probably are some bad seeds. There are probably a lot of bad seeds. And a lot of bad acts get committed in our name. But the only way to change it, really, is for good people to stand up when they see things that are wrong and point it out and say, this is wrong. This is a common theme on this show. It doesn't matter your political slant on the issues. It doesn't matter your kind of view on the military. But what does matter is that when you see something wrong, when you see an injustice in the world, you got to stand up and shout about it and point it out to people and take an action at some point. That action may have consequences, but it's what I do here on this show. I try to point out the injustices in the world because if people don't see them, if people don't know about them, they're not going to care about them and nothing's going to change. No matter what your situation in life, if you're miserable, if you're unhappy, if you wake up every day with a sick feeling in your stomach as James Newcomb did every single day that he was in the army getting up to blow that trumpet, something he loved doing, but to be doing it for what he started to feel was a really bad cause, a really immoral cause. If you're in a situation where you're not happy, though, it doesn't need to be as extreme as James's. It could just be a job or a relationship. 
It could be anything, really. But you can't just sit there forever, forever and ever and continue to be miserable. You cannot just accept this fate. I encourage you, if you're unhappy, people, change your situation. Find a way to fix it. Find a way to stand up and make it so that you can live with what you're doing every single day. Because really, individual liberty is great, but if you're not using it, (laughs) if you're not using it to your fullest extent, if you're not using it to make yourself happy, well then what is the point? What is the point, my friends? Now, if you found James Newcomb's tale, his story to be interesting, guess what? You can communicate with him directly because he's a member of the Lions of Liberty Forum, our private group on Facebook, where we encourage people to come on over and join the conversation. It's called the Lions of Liberty Forum. Again, you can just type Lions of Liberty Forum in your little search bar on Facebook. We'll also link to it in the show notes at lionsofliberty.com slash 206. Just request to join, and as long as you don't look like a spam bot, we'll let you right in there and join the conversation. We did actually get one spam bot the other week. I had a very strange article about ovarian cancer posted from someone who appeared to be from Nigeria and uh, immediately deleted their account. So once in a while, they do slip through our security system. But for the most part, it's a wonderful place where people are encouraged to talk about the show, talk about whatever ideas they want to bring out there, and we generally have a good old time. And it sure is growing, so we invite you to come on over to our private group, Lions of Liberty Forum. Stay tuned, because this coming Wednesday... I'll have yet another libertarian presidential candidate on the show. That's right. Dr. Mark Allen Feldman will be here. He's a really interesting guy, another candidate for the Libertarian Party, and he's kind of got a different take on libertarianism, on the philosophy of liberty, and and on his sort of way he's promoting the ideas of liberty through his presidential campaign. So I'm looking forward to that. Until then, folks, live long!